we are here with Patrick McGinnis, who is an international man of mystery, venture capitalist, author, New York Times bestseller, traveled to... 103 countries. How many languages have your books been translated into? Uh, boy, if you add them all, like 15 plus or something. Okay, so the books, The Fear of Missing Out, The 10% Entrepreneur, FOMO Sapiens. But that's just that one in Italian. Oh. <laughs> just so you know. They change the titles when they translate. <laughs> and they don't even ask. They just do it. <laughs> let's, let's just kind of dig in. I'll, actually, I want to start at 10% Entrepreneur. Okay. Primarily because we could potentially have a bone to pick here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Roro. Got to have drama to start with. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, actually, start off. What, what is the overall idea of the 10% Entrepreneur? And then I want to dig into... Uh, maybe the boat thing. I'm, you know what? I, I take away. Uh, <laughs> the Ten Percent Entrepreneur is a book about the idea that that entrepreneurship is something that you can start gradually. That you don't simply, if you want to be an entrepreneur, a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs, but the idea of going in full time is scary, daunting, inaccessible for different reasons. So I recommend that. You start with 10% of your time and energy and then scale up from there if you like. It's also the idea that everybody should do that because you can't rely on your day job. There is no stable career out there. I lived it myself. My career completely imploded in 2008. And so 10% Entrepreneurship offers a pathway to diversification for everybody, whether they're starting a company and running it, whether they're investing in other people's companies, whether they're advising people's companies. It's a way to build a portfolio of economic interests that that is, uh, exists outside of your day job that belongs to you and nobody else. What happened in 2008? I was working at AIG. And well, you know, <laughs> my stock, I had this stock that I bought, cause, and I thought I was so smart, because you get a discount as an employee, so I got a 15% discount, and I was like, wow, what an arbitrage, <laughs> until, <laughs> I know, until it fell 97%. And then there was, there, there was a great like, tax write-off ARB, I guess, but that was all I had to show. It's interesting, do, do you think that, <clears throat> How many people who are successful entrepreneurs have have started with that, you know, ten percent, twenty five percent, whatever it is, and then they are able to effectively go into it? But it's interesting because I think you're also coming from a different perspective. Is that no? It doesn't need to be your hundred percent thing. Mm-hmm. You just have the side thing. Mm-hmm. But maybe we can go into it if that is even possible. You know, I, I guess in the people that I've spoken with over the years. Are you picking the bone right now? Is that what's happening? I am. Okay. To this. This is, this is big. Okay. Um, you know, I, I um, maybe this is just my own, projecting my own experience, but I found that I couldn't effectively dedicate the time necessary to a, a, a business um, and being able to truly think through it and then build it on a 10% way. Or I found that, you know, like, if I had my day job and I'm doing this 10%, like, I'm not all in. And, and maybe this is just a narrow definition of entrepreneurship. But I'm curious to hear, like, what, how many people are you interacting with who can effectively make that switch? Yes. And do you think this is that they start at 10% entrepreneurship, that that's the framework, or that, no, you just need to have 10% as part of your overall portfolio forever, your side hustle. So first of all, I'll say that going all in, I'm not anti, like your decision that you need to do it full time, I respect that. And I think for some people that is absolutely the right thing to do because of the reasons that you have noted. Like for you, you need to have your skin in the game in order to be committed, in order to dedicate the time you need, in order to scale it the way you wanted to. So that's fantastic. Now, the reality is though, for other people, that's just not going to happen. They're afraid uh, they don't know what their idea is going to work. They don't want to fail. And so what, you know, I think what the way I think about it is, number one, everybody should be doing this. Everybody, I'm not saying you have to start something. You can get involved in the entrepreneurial venture of somebody else, right? Like as an investor or an advisor. So the way I think about entrepreneurship is broader than simply founding your own company and running it. It can be that, you know, I love your idea, so I want to get some sweat equity by, you know, spending 10 hours a week working on your idea and, and helping you out, or maybe I invest in your company. But I do think there is this sort of interesting path, which is the person who says, I want to be an entrepreneur. I haven't done it before. I don't even know if I'm going to like it. 
I'm afraid. I don't know if my idea makes sense. Let me start out on nights and weekends. Let me work on this. Let me see if this idea gets a little traction. And if it does and I start to grow and maybe I can raise some capital, then sure, I will go full time or even half time. I have great examples in the book about people who uh, started something on the side. It started to grow. They needed more time. They went to their employer to quit and the employer said, why don't you just stay three days a week and then you can spend two days a week on your project. And so they were able to do that for years, have the safety and stability of that stable paycheck that was projectable, but then be able to work on the upside of their startup. And I think that's what I don't want people to do. I don't want people to quit their job. And then I've seen it a million times, like I'm an investment banker, I have a million dollars in the bank, I quit my job, I'm gonna do my startup. A year later, they've run through half a million dollars, they have not achieved their objectives, and they end up going back to their job. We don't want that. So I'm trying to give people a sustainable like path. 10% of that. <laughs> <laughs> Before I started, I didn't have a million in the bank, and we didn't. Um, but I, I think that's really interesting in terms of it doesn't have to be your full time, hundred percent company. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, you know, your ten percent entrepreneurial uh, time doesn't have to be your venture. You could be advising. You could be applying your skills that you develop for five, ten, fifteen years, advising. Um, what are some of the favorite stories of people who have kind of applied this concept? How did they successfully do it? So there's a, a bunch of, what's cool about the, the original book and then ever since then I've just, you know, I've interviewed and spoken to so many people on my podcast and also in my new book is um, I, I meet all these people. And so, you know, it's, they're everywhere, of course. It's like a movement. But one of my favorite ones that I think is really maybe some people who are watching today might know is, do you know the podcast Robin Hood Snacks? Have yeah. you come across that one? Robin Hood Snacks is a top podcast. It basically um, started out before it was called Market Snacks. These two friends, Jack Kramer and, and Nick Martell, one was an investment banker, Jack, and Nick worked at Endeavor, which is an entrepreneurship organization. And they were sort of doing like a daily candy for financial news. It was a daily email with like three stock picks and some fun kind of fratty, bro -y kind of commentary, really fun. And they just did it kind of on a, on a whim. And they did that while they had their day jobs and they did it for a number of years. And I met these guys sort of in that time. They ended up going off to business school, kept doing it. During the summer, their summer job was launching a podcast. That podcast got pretty popular and they ended up being acquired by Robin Hood and now are Robin Hood's podcast and sort of their content business. And so they were able to build and scale a business, you know, while having very demanding jobs, by the way, and then they sell it to Robin Hood. So that, that's a story that I love and, and they've really built something special for themselves. Um, you know, another I, I'm going to tell one I love just because it's it's made me so happy is uh, and hopefully, you know, very profitably uh, as well. A nice outcome is I invested in one of my good friends startups when it was kind of in the idea phase. And, you know, it was at the time felt really scary to write that check. That company has gone on to become, um, you know, a company that's doing over a billion dollar in revenue. And so obviously my shares are worth a lot more. So it makes me happy. I'll look at that. It's like Mike Pence in the fly. It's going to land right here. Um, and so more than that, though, when the, you know, obviously it's fantastic to have a financial return like that that is so powerful that I would never get anywhere else, um, you know, high risk, high reward. But I got to work with a good friend and actually try to help in the early days with connections and ideas. And so that's what happens when you're a 10% entrepreneur. Either, you know, you're running your own thing or you're doing it as, you know, supporting other people's is that you're leveraging all these skills you've been building across your career. Um, and you may like your day job, by the way. I'm not saying you hate your day job, you have to do this, but it's just like, you have all these skills, like you can use them flexibly. You don't have to be a million hours a week at something and you can still really build value. And so I just like to see when people who are smart and talented don't limit themselves to whatever it says on their business card, but think bigger and broader because there's so much opportunity out there to, to make money. Yes, of course, we wanna do that, that's a good thing, but also just to like live a bigger, more interesting life. I think that you, what is on the topic of like interesting life, I, I do think you have one of the most fascinating lives and, and, and life journeys, right? You've been to uh, 100 plus countries, you have written books, you've invested, 
you've gotten to know amazing people. What what do you find is really kind of the key motivation that you found consistent? Maybe it's not consistent, maybe it's evolved. What do you think has been your primary motivation for doing what you're doing now, you know, 20 plus years in your career? Yeah. So I think about this a lot, actually. It's like a thing I've thought about a lot with this new FOMO book, too, and the topic of FOMO, because Service there now. it is. Boom. Um, when I was a kid growing up in a small town in Maine, my brother, who's a jazz musician here in New York City and me, we were different. I was like a super nerd, super into music and speaking and like stuff and like my brother was a musician and like nerdy too, like, and we were made fun of horribly. They didn't say bullying at the time. That wasn't a word that people used, but like we were certainly. Special, was that around the time? I guess so. People picked up. <laughs> I got booed off the stage when I ran for class vice president in ninth grade because people like hated me. Really? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I wasn't a jerk or anything. They just like didn't like me for some reason. Anyway, I didn't really care. I, I seriously was like, no, like, I was, I was like, these people, what they're doing is fine. It's not what I want to do. I have another vision for myself. I'm going to do it. I don't care if it's not popular or liked or whatever. And so I made it out through, I, and that was like a very valuable experience about just having a sense of one's purpose and self as a kid. And my parents supported us. So like that, we also had the, in, the internal support at home to be like, yeah, like go for it, kid. Like you should do that. Right. Then. I went into America's higher educational um, world. I went to Georgetown and Harvard Business School, both of which I love, by the way, and I don't fault them. But you were put into this, like, treadmill of achievement that says, like, if you're smart and talented, you should work on Wall Street or be a lawyer or whatever. Which, by the way, those are all good things, and I'm glad I did them. You know, I'm glad I was on Wall Street. But you start to lose your sense of being willing to buck the trend or do something original. And what I've seen now is like all my friends from those institutions that have really achieved something spe like spectacular or special were the ones who were willing to turn their backs on those sort of tried and true paths to find the thing. Maybe, I mean, some people are just meant to be amazing investment bankers and it's like more power to them. But the rest of us were like sort of just like fake it till you make it. I was not good at it. So I'm glad I built the skills, but it was time to leave. And so Can we compare how who was worse at this? I know you were really bad too. <laughs> <laughs> I was really bad, man. I, I had like a, a model one time that wouldn't it was like a huge one too, and it was for a PE deal and like it was so bad that like a guy pulled me into a conference room and screamed at me and I got, he got fired shortly thereafter for screaming at me so hard. Did you have that happen? No, because I didn't I wasn't able to do the financial. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was I was at a boutique and I came in at the time where I was able basically to hide in the function of uh, reaching out to corporates mm. and private equity firms on the international deals that we were hired to sell. So I was able to do more of a sales function as opposed to like the hardcore, you know, analyst and associate skills. And then in the last two to three years of my six years of banking is when the New York office, you know, out of the 10 global offices evolved into, you know, getting hired on legitimate U.S. cell sites when guess what? You need to do the financial. Oh, <laughs> the moment has come. That. And so it, but it, it worked out where it was it, me leaving banking and then, you know, them giving me the severance and laying me off we went from you know, 90 or so bankers down to 60 overnight, Ooh. and I was one of in the New York office. And uh, it was the best thing that could happen to me. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say, I was a shitty banker, and like the, but I, what I realized, I was really, um, you know, I was able to, uh, I, actually, I don't know what I was able to do. I was able to hide in being a shitty banker and not have the fundamental skills set. Yeah, you had other things. That's the thing that happens is like, I remember I interviewed for a PE job and they're like, what's your best skill? And I was like, I'm amazing with people. And they looked at me like, like they were just like, why? Are, they just looked at me like they didn't respect that. And I was like, I rem and the, the reality is that like, that's edge, man. Like anybody can build a model. And by the way, half of financial models should be like a quarter of what they are. The guys who build the best models are the ladies. 
that spent all the hours doing it. Like, what are they? I mean, it's all, I mean, you have to build a model. Yes, but you see hedge funds investing billions off of like a five line model, and then some dopey guy and some like mid market private equity firm who has like a fifty thousand gigabyte model to do a deal with a company with one hundred million of you but It's just it's silliness. Anyway, back to my point. I have a lot of feelings. Um, back to my point is when I realized that I could find my own path and I had the courage to leave, thankfully, because I'd saved a lot of money. And also, like, AIG blew up and I was like, well, this is like, I'm, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're leaving a war-torn country behind. You're like, I'm going to just move to a new country. Once I did that, and then it took a long time. It wasn't overnight. But over the course of that, I have been able to build something that is way closer to what I'm good at. And when it's closer to what you're good at, you just win more. And so, like, it's not – I have lots of lousy days and lots of bad things happen. But just I have built something that is much more um, tied into the things that I think I do that are special. And I have so much more fun. It's amazing. So, you know, fast forwarding to now in 2021, like, your typical week is usually – like, how do you divide the pie of time in your week? What is it generally yeah. divide into? It's really unpredictable. But I've kind of figured out a way to – um, to create like these interesting pockets that I spend time on. So part of my time is like sort of very much like a paying the bills kind of work. I do some, uh, some consulting work. Um, you know, I sit on a board. So, I mean, I like those things, but they're really things that I do because I know that they're sources of income that are predictable that you know, sort of keep the lights on at home. Um, second part is more of like the building wealth part. So sort of instead of, you know, sort of generating income, building wealth, which is, I'm a partner uh, in the investment committee of a VC fund, so I do investing there. I have my own portfolio of VC investments that I've made over the years. So over time, those are you know the capacity to really you know sort of generate the alpha for me. And then the third um, is sort of the all of the stuff around content, and that's sort of the long tail. Number one, it creates opportunities for all the things that I do, but it's and it creates income, of course. But it's like you know the books and the speaking and the podcast. It's, a, it's building a business that is really just my business. It's my baby, it's my startup. And then as part of that, one thing that I'm able to do are two things is number one, I do some very speculative stuff. So like working on an NFT or working on like making a TV show or something that are, that are things that like may go nowhere but they don't take a lot of time. And the final thing um, is um, I do things that are really close to my, you know, my kind of heart, I guess I would say, or like impact things that are more about not make about not about making money. It's more about generating impact. So I'm very involved in some political stuff. I'm involved on the board of the Sesame Workshop on the Leadership Council, and so you know, working with Sesame to to help kids around the world. So those things all fit together. Everything I do, there's nothing I do that it doesn't help in another area. But you know, I try to think of like income generation, wealth generation, impact generation. That's how I think about it. Favorite character on Sesame Street? Grover. Why? Uh, I just think he's the one that has the most FOMO. This is an argument I had at brunch yesterday with some people from Sesame. Apparently, Telly is supposed to be the anxiety character. So they were like, no, Telly's your guy. And I'm like, no, no, no. Because Telly is afraid of the world. Grover's ambitious. He, you know, because he wants to win. And I think that's why he has the FOMO. Which is a good transition. <laughs> and it's the color of Grover, by the way. <laughs> Wait, what? Grover's, you know, blue. It's this is not the same shade, but there we go. Okay, I mean, let's let's kind of dive into this. So, fear of missing out mm. is the name of the book. Practical decision making in a world of overwhelming choice. Mm. How? What are some of the factors contributing to us being? overwhelmed as a in the you know Amer american society yeah i mean it's america but it's really the world i mean i think the reality is that mobile phone penetration is in the u.s it's, it's greater than one per person right i mean we all it's insane and so we, we if we think about the definition of fomo fomo is about an anxiety produced by the perception that there's something better out there than what we're doing right now how do we get those how do we how do, how do, we, how do we figure out what is happening out there um, it's because we're getting inputs. It's the cell phone that ping, it's the notification on Instagram, it's the social media, it's media in general. All of these inputs that are telling us there's something bright and shiny out there that we should be chasing after, right? And so that is, as a result, if you think about it, technology gives us more information than we've ever had before. 
Uh, it gives us more opportunities to see what people are doing than before. And it also gives us more opportunities to compare ourselves to other people and feel like, inadequate and have reference anxiety. And so that is why, you know, FOMO is not, the, the feelings behind FOMO are not new to the human experience. In fact, the, the, the comic strip Keeping Up with the Joneses, which is like analog FOMO, is from 100 years ago. But we need the word today because we are just, basically, the world conspires to give us FOMO every moment of every day. What level of FOMO is good? Is there a necessary evil? Is there a necessary amount of anxiety that is good? Most definitely. In fact, you know, I think it's an, it's, it, FOMO is an external trigger that causes us to have ambition and want to do things. And so there's a positivity to it. I think of drinking wine when I think of FOMO. A little wine, maybe you'll loosen up, you know, try something new, go on the dance floor, ask that girl out, whatever. Drinking five bottles of wine, you're going to end up in a bad place. You're going to have a hangover, right? Same with FOMO. A little FOMO awakens us to possibility and convinces us to try new things. But what we need to do when we have FOMO is think like a 10% entrepreneur, dip our toe in. You know, if you, for example, marathon, running the marathon. I remember I had marathon FOMO. I didn't just go off and run a marathon because I was not going to be able to do that. I started training for a 10K and then I did a half and then I, you know, I built my way up. And so I think, I think like anything um, that looks great on the surface and of course FOMO is based on perception. You have to make sure the perception is not deception. You have to figure out if the thing lives up to its potential uh, in your head. And you also need to actually figure out if you like it before you decide to do that thing. First, where, uh, what's the background on FOMO? I, I think it was in, when you're at HBS and this kind of would have know about it from high level, but let's throw more of the background. Yeah, so I, I showed up at HBS in 2002 now, oh my goodness, a long time ago. And I had just lived through the 9-11 attacks in New York um, the year before, and that really changed, I think, everybody, uh, especially those of us who were here that day. You just sort of felt like, I've got to live life to the fullest, carpe diem all the time. A lot like now coming out of the pandemic, to be honest, you're sort of like, life is precious. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen. There could be another. And HBS is a very choice rich environment in terms of fun, in terms of jobs, in terms of intellectual opportunities. And so I was, you pair those two together, choice rich, uh, just like sort of wanting to live life to the fullest and then being surrounded by a bunch of type A personalities and everybody is trying to do it all. And you start comparing yourself with everybody and I, I was the king of this. I was at every event on campus. I went to every party, every trip, every everything, to the point where I wasn't even having fun anymore and I just felt stressed. And so I started calling that FOMO, fear of missing out. And as we graduated, I wrote an article in our school newspaper, a satirical article in the humor section about this crazy FOMO thing at HBS and how we were all going back to normal life and we were not gonna feel that way anymore, ha ha ha. But unbeknownst to me, a mile away was Mark Zuckerberg living in Harvard Yard, developing the first version of Facebook. In fact, he actually rented my friend's apartment for the summer and trashed it, um, and, did, and so they didn't give him back his, his security deposit. So that happened. Uh, and he took FOMO and made it something we could all feel. It wasn't just a niche experience. And so that, that's kind of the background of FOMO. I mean, 10 years later, I mean, I graduated. I was like, dumb. Done with the FOMO, I moved to New York, I was working all the time. And then 10 years later, a reporter called me and said, I'm writing an article about the history of FOMO. I've traced it back to you. And I was sort of like, and then he said, you know, it's in the dictionary. And I looked it up and I remember, I was like, whoa. And so I did an interview with him and he wrote an article and it went sort of viral. And that was the reason I got my first book deal, believe it or not. So yeah, the FOMO was, it's power. It's got a lot of power. What are some of the frameworks that you use consciously that like actually guide your life? When I think about decision making in particular, so there are a couple things that I do that are like really, I've been doing them for years and they are powerful. So one of the things that really holds people back in decision making and the other term I invented besides FOMO is called FOBO or fear of a better option. And so it's like, I have a very simple decision to make. It's like, it literally, am I going to go for a run today or am I not going to go for a run today? 
Simple. Or am I going to have the chicken or am I going to have the fish? It's a simple decision. Either one is fine. Not going to change your life. You won't remember making this decision in three days. But yet people agonize and it is horrible and it's a great procrastination tool. So one thing that I do that's really powerful and it sounds so simple and you'll be like, Patrick, that's stupid. But I promise you, if you do it, it'll change your life because people tell me all the time that it changed your life. As I just say, okay, am I going to the gym today? Well, if it's the left side of my watch, I'm going. And if it's the right side of my watch, I'm not going. Look down, see where the second, okay, I'm not going today, done. Actually, I actually was doing that for real, by the way, in that moment, because <laughs> uh, I was thinking about going. So that is a great example of outsourcing an unimportant decision to the universe. I do the same thing when it comes to, to sort of more, slightly more important decisions, what I call, those are no stakes decisions, a low stakes decision, which is like, where should we go to dinner? Uh, which printer should I buy? You know, I don't know because I go on Amazon to buy a printer and there's 983 choices. So I simply find somebody who I think is more knowledgeable than me or who's willing to help me. And I say, listen, I'm looking to spend to buy a printer in this range. Or I go to wire cutter and I simply just go with what the person recommends. And we all know that person who wants to pick the restaurant or knows about tech. I outsource so much of my decision making now for the things that aren't core that it gives me the space to dedicate to free time for thinking, to making more important decisions. The other thing is that I've become very attuned to when I feel indecision and FOMO or when I see it in other people and I simply don't tolerate it. So when you have that friend who keeps on changing the plans or won't commit to something, I call them out. I'll just say, listen, you know, if you're not willing to commit today by five o'clock, why don't we just do it another time? And you know what happens? They always respond because people respond to scarcity. They always respond. And that's like basic stuff from like Robert Cialdini influence, but people respond to a bunch of different triggers. But you know, when it comes to decision-making, there's specific ones like scarcity, social proof that you, you can de deploy to get people to make decisions and you can also force yourself to use. Let's talk a little more about scarcity because I think that one of the things I've had to work through in, in my life is that I've, because of getting poor grades because of not getting into the quote unquote jobs that I wanted fresh out of school. I, you know, this kind of recurring underdog mentality, mm -hmm. or I'm not valuable. I'm not worthwhile. And so I never, so I'm more of like a y'all come and have a big party kind of mentality, which has been created a lot of good and fulfillment in my life, but I don't understand the scarcity puzzle the scarcity mentality, how do you create that? Um, you know, what are some ways to kind of, I mean, just how do you think about scarcity mm -hmm. in creating value? I know that's very vague, but you know, I didn't know if there are any kind of things that are sticking out in your mind. Well, it's a really interesting point you just made because I was raised and I don't follow my parents. My parents are awesome, but I come from a blue collar community where anybody who ever got out of there, it's because they just worked. And usually you go to college where everybody is more economically advantaged than you. You're scrappy. You have to, it's scrappy, scrappy, scrappy. It's how you like claw your way up. And it's not like I come from like, you know, abject poverty either. It's just, but you know, it's like, that's yeah. the mindset. I think Americans do, it's all about the hero's journey mm -hmm. and stuff. So anyway, I always, you know, was that way. And then when I left my job and started doing more entrepreneurial stuff, I became really focused on like saving money and I had this scarcity mindset that I didn't even know the term. And about a year, a year ago, I was talking to this coach um, who had called me because she wanted to talk about FOMO, but I just totally like turned it into like yeah. a session. I was like, well, I got you. Let's talk about me. And so she was like, you have a scarcity mindset. Because I was, I was telling her that I love what I do, but that the, the lack of predictability in terms of some of the things that I do in terms of building wealth, because you know, I built this portfolio, but it's a liquid, it makes it difficult to plan. And so I don't want to like, you know, do things that would overextend me financially because I was, I was raised to be very conservative, right? So even though I could afford to do it, I don't. And she was like, you have a scarcity mindset. And I was like, what is that? So I Googled it and I realized I did. And that in fact, I, I was always assuming that like what I have now, I have to protect it like, it, like it's a fortress because I don't know if something bad will happen. And once I realized that, it really empowered me to start thinking like, okay, are you 
investing in the right things? Are you being afraid to invest because you're worried about, you know, putting capital into things with uncertain returns? And it was a very powerful shift in mindset for me that I've been working on. It's still hard work. But in terms of the scarcity that I'm talking about, let me give you a great example. So I talked to um, the founder of Hotel Tonight, Hotels Tonight, Hotel Tonight. And uh, they found that um, basically his name is Sam Shank. They found that, you know, their whole model is simplicity. It's like we give you nine choices or whatever the number is um, in order to make it really simple for you to choose. But they still found that millennials who are, you know, busy, lifestyle, indecisive people weren't willing to choose an option. They keep leaving the app and then going and shopping some more and they had a FOBO, fear of a better option. And so they created this thing called the Daily Drop. And the Daily Drop says, okay, you may have seen this when you go in. Uh, special deal, you have 15 minutes and then it's gone. That's, and you know what they found? People either made a decision then, they'd either buy in the first minute or the last 30 seconds. And so by creating... When you're trying to get somebody to make a decision, either yourself or somebody else, but easier with other people, and just saying basically like, you know, this is the deal, take it or leave it, uh, you know, I think it's a very powerful way of getting people to just stop stringing you along. I mean, you've done fundraising for a company. How many times have you gone to investors? Oh, we just like to see a little more data another month. Come back in a month, let us know. Those people work and invest anyway. You just need to tell them like, we're closing this round. If you're interested, invest now because the valuation goes up the day after. And then you'll see the people who didn't invest weren't gonna do it anyway. And so I think that's what I, when I talk about scarcity, it's that. Time is of the essence, you gotta move, you can't just sort of continuing waiting for the perfect option, you have to make a decision. You know, I I think that the idea of simplicity is uh, overcomplicated, (laughs) right? And it's interesting because I even find that when I'm producing something, let's say it's like a pitch book or whatever, or I'm trying to give like really thoughtful feedback on something. If I know I'm trying to do something that feels important or is has gravity to it, it almost like never gets done because I want it to be so good. I suppose like, what is the simplest solution to this? And just get that first version done. And then you can iterate. It, uh, there was actually a former client who was just like, hey, just give me a first fail version of this. I like that. So he was literally giving me permission for a bad version. And then the funny thing is like, guess what? It took me still like five times as long just to do that damn deliverable. And it was like, it really pointed out something about, you know, how difficult it is just to do simple things. And I don't know if this is talking about scarcity or not, (laughs) but it's, but what what you're making me think about is just simplicity. In decision making. Yeah, I, I like to call it. I invented this new term called the eighty-one nineteen rule. Eighty-one. It's like the eighty twenty rule, but it's one off, so I can say I invented it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, I think. Listen, the reality is that we live in a time where think about like let's just take your conundrum, okay? Put let's let's put you back in 1975. If you wanted to redo your darn pitch, like you, it would take like days. Now you can change the draft a million times. That's like the models, financial models. It's like, mm-hmm. how many times can you just change the assumptions? I remember being in, in for, for private equity and you do the, the silly model. And then the process like, well, like, mm, yeah, like have we done it like a pressure test though on gross margin? And you're like, why? Like we know the gross margin. Well, I just want to see, you know, there's a lot of that. And so you end up into this analysis paralysis space that is enabled by the fact that it's so easy to run analyses. Think about that one. So is the secret, look at the secret of happiness of life here. The, do you think one of the key parts of your uh, fulfillment and happiness in life has been that you're just able to make decisions faster, more simply, and overall just creates less anxiety. And how many many decisions have you looked back on? I really made a poor decision because of that. And did it actually result in a truly negative long-term effect? There are things that really aren't gonna move the needle. Like sometimes I'll be like, I would, like, oh, I wish I didn't spend that much money on this thing or I, whatever. But that doesn't really matter in the wider context. When it comes to the big things, I think I generally 
do the work and take counsel and think through them and then I'm decisive and so therefore I'm comfortable that you know there is no riskless decision I haven't had I'm trying to think if I if you go back and you question all your decisions and the road untaken I can think of examples of like where I could have made a lot of money on something I could have invested in a business um, that I passed on I have a couple of those that were big hits and I really don't feel bad about it because it's sort of like you know, it could have been that I invested and then I was going to a board meeting and the plane fell out of the sky. So I just don't see the value. I think it's good to learn from the experience and say, okay, why did I make that decision? Might I do it differently in the next time? I can tell you why I made the decision. I can justify it to you. Um, and so I know why I did it. It wasn't just irrational, right? Um, but if you, I think, I always think about missing, do you ever read Great Expectations? No. Great Expectations, Charles Dickens. It's a, it's a big book. I, I was that kid who would like pick the biggest book to read when I was a kid. So I was like, this. I was like in second grade. I'm like, well, this is 500 pages. Like, let me take this baby down. Um, it's a good book. It's a movie too. You can just do that. But there's this woman called Mrs. Havisham, Miss Havisham, who on the day of her wedding, like the wedding doesn't happen, and she spends the rest of her life living in her wedding dress and like with a cake and all this stuff in her house and like never leaves and lives in this decrepit state of regret and fear of moving forward. And I just will not do that. And I think that's probably my superpower is I just push through. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's what happiness is for me and for many people. And I would also say the other part is when you have FOMO, you value what other people have and you disvalue what you have. You're so focused on what the shiny bright object that you're not tied to all the good things that you have. And in fact, FOMO, the pathology happens when you're so in your head about things that are probably not even true that you forget to tie yourself back to the good and the real in your own life, which is why meditation is so powerful as a tool for anxiety because you're forced to be grounded in the real. And so I would say gratitude and, you know, positive psychology, which I'm sure you read. Totally you, John. Yeah. And like, I love the happiness advantage by, um, Sean Ackor and who blurred my book, which was really cool. And then also, um, Walter um, Isaacson, Flores, and other books like that. They talk about the fact that if you write down three things you're grateful for every day, it actually changes your brain chemistry. And so that's one thing I do every day. I think of three things I'm happy for. And, you know, it doesn't have to be the big thing. It doesn't have to be like I'm, you know, you'll have those days in life where like you almost get hit by a car or you find out somebody tested for a really big disease and they're, they're okay. Like we have those and those are, those are big ones, right? But it can be little, it can be just like, hey, I'm just glad to have you over the house, you know? So I try to think of those things every day and I do think it's helped. I mean, I've seen in COVID, I should have lost my head and I've been pretty okay because of that orientation towards gratitude. Um, out of the 100 plus countries that you have traveled to, what do you think are just some of the biggest things that you've learned? Mm, that's a good question. I've never been asked that before. Hmm. From the people or in terms of myself? Who, like, in, I, Wait a second. We're going, this, is this, am I pioneering some content here? Yeah. That's surprising what the amount of This content. should be my next book. There we go. This is a book, by the way. If, if people want to read it, I don't know. But, oh, wow. 100, 103 countries. Mm -hmm. How to decide where to go. I mean, that's hard, too. Um, well, let's just kind of go through, like, you know, with in, in all these countries that you've, you've been to, like, what are the big lessons from traveling? You know, it's like the classic thing. It's like, you know, I went there to teach the people something, but they taught me. You know, it's like those people who, like, did mentoring or something. Uh, so I would say, number one, I would say that the world is just easy these days. Like, traveling now versus 20 years ago, it's so easy. Like, you almost don't have to do anything. You just roll in. And that's why I've become obsessed with finding places that are farther and farther off the path. So it used to be that like, going to Argentina was, like, very edgy when I was in college. In the 90s, now I, like, I go to, like, Turkmenistan or the Gambia, which is an awesome country. Um, so that's one thing is I've learned that, like, the easier travel got, the more I wanted it to be like to get that dopamine hit, I needed to go to places that were more and more off the grid and more where there were less travelers. I'd say that's number one. Number two is, um, you know, I really do think it's interesting when you've traveled a ton, how you start to contextualize across places and see the similarities. Like, 
you know, <laughs> there are more countries than you would expect that really love melons and like have melon festivals. Like it's a thing. I don't know. Or <laughs> melons are good. Um, not as good as the Kazakh melon because those are the best. <laughs> but you know, you start to notice these sort of cultural um, sort of comparisons you can make. You're in a part of Peru and you're like, oh, this looks a little bit like southern China or something like that. And I think being able to like contextualize across cultures is something that's really valuable to do. I'd also say that when you've been forced to be self-reliant, which I travel, you know, real travel, not just like fancy city travel, real travel is about being self-reliant. You are also just a better citizen because when you're self-reliant, it means you are comfortable talking to people that aren't like you, reaching out to people, trying new things, um, taking risks, you know, calculated risks. And so as a result, like when you're in any environment, you're just way, like, I have no problem. I'll talk to anybody and I'll be, and I also assume, I don't assume people that are different from me are scary or bad because they're just different. And so I think those are the things that I've really learned. Um, I've also learned, I think the final one is that, you know, there's a lot of inequality in the world. And I think that people who, people who stay in their own bubble, inequality in terms of racial equity, economic equity, People who don't mix with people that are like them, that aren't like them, excuse me. If you don't meet people who aren't like you and you're interested and curious in the world, you are far more likely to be closed-minded, to be disliking of people, to be untrusting of people. And so I always encourage people, I have many friends from college who you know, have just ended up in a place where they don't meet people that aren't like them and they become closed-minded and they start doing things, that they start saying things, you're like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. You need to push yourself out of your comfort zone. You need to mix with people who aren't like you. Um, even a city like New York, where we're so, we have so many different types of people. If you only stay in one neighborhood and you never take the subway and you don't have to see people, I mean, you're not gonna, you're just gonna end up being big, close-minded. We don't want that. How do you write a book? Uh, that's a great question. I, I look at, you know, my my life, and I, I do want to. I don't care if, I get, if one person reads it. I just I want to do something that is the marathon of content because mm -hmm. I've done endurance races. But a marathon to me is like three thousand characters in a LinkedIn post. Mm -hmm. Like that's. But I want to be able to put together a comprehensive, you know, uh, just comprehensive lessons on. I don't care if anybody reads it. I just want to get that on paper. Like, how did you? You've produced multiple books, and like, how have you done it? I'm gonna tell you a secret, but you, you can't, else to you can't tell anybody. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't hire somebody. I mean, I guess if you want to, I wrote both my books every word. Um, they were, and they weren't even that heavily edited. I'm, I'm. If you read my books, you, it's just like talking to me. I, I felt like no interest in having anybody else write it. I knew I could do better. I knew I like my book would be the best it could be if I wrote it. I was very confident in that. See, I would have to have someone interview me mm. and translate it. I'm like, oh, that's my, that would be my voice. You could do that. I mean, you could also just practice and get your voice out there. But what I'll say is this. Um, you just mentioned a 3,000 word LinkedIn post. Well, you take about uh, 20 of those together and you have a book. That's how I thought about it when I... Well, you're saying something really interesting, okay. right? It's how do you do something really that takes time, that takes a lot of effort. My perception of writing a book is that it's very difficult. And I asked you know, other people, how have you done an Ironman? How have you done a marathon? How did you do a marathon in Antarctica? And it's like, it's easy. Just focus on that pole right there. Focus on the next poll. Focus on the next poll. How do you write a book? Do fifteen hundred words. Be decisive. Be decisive. I have met so many people, and like, I don't want to drag anybody. Like I listen. Anybody who's writing a book, I'm there for them. I support them. It's a great thing to do. Um, and and for some people, it's harder than others. But like, I just did it. I didn't like overthink it. I met. I meet people. They're like, well, I'm in like my book. It's like a year eight. I'm working on it. You know, I'm sort of like, what have you been doing? Like, how long is your book? Well, it's 40,000 words. Well, like, that's like, I don't get that because, you know, how I... How many words is like, how, first, how many pages is a typical? So it's all, we writers talk in terms of words, which is 50 to 60,000 is a business book, 225 pages-ish. Okay. On the, at 60,000 is about 225 pages. Okay. Um, you know, I wrote 
if you look at the way my books are, I'm giving away the secrets to the house, but like I, each chapter is, is whatever length it is, but like typically it's different sections that are like a thousand and fifteen hundred words per section in the chapter. And so I, it's, that allows you to have like vignettes and structures. And, you know, I also, another thing about the way I write my books is I Michael Lewis them, which means that I just find amazing people and interview them. Mm -hmm. And that gives me great ideas for content and stories that I can share. Mm -hmm. This book was different. The FOMO book required more primary research because it's a psychology book. And so I needed to make sure that I was being, I was, I was being accurate on the science of it all. And so, and also I'm not a psychologist, so I really want to nail that and get it right. The other thing is all my books are business books so far because I ground them in my expertise. So I think it's like, it's this combination of finding the topic, figuring out your unique sort of message you want to share finding the right people to give you amazing content that you can then, you know, put into your book, knowing how to structure it, and then just sitting down and doing it. I, I wrote both my books by I, in six weeks. I treated it like investment banking. I really like that. This gives me a good idea, which is that we've done 65 episodes in the mm -hmm. past two years. And yes, they are 95% from people in the mergers and acquisitions community. But a lot of it is more like, tell me life lessons, tell me about your life, mm -hmm. what's the extrapolation of that? For example, this one person, uh, uh, Elise Rodriguez at Avante Capital, she had this one story about when they grew up on the south side of Chicago, uh, her dad would wake, she and her two other sisters up. Gina and the other one. And then they would wake up and they would, you know, her dad would say, look in the mirror and say, today is a great day, I can and I will. And then you know, do your push-ups and your jumping jacks, and then that's how it started. And they started like they were in a really, really difficult neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But that literally, that back in March of 2020, when the pandemic was just starting, that carried. That was one of the key things that really shaped our mentality all of last year. So I can get those stories, and then I think maybe as we dive into the 65 episodes, we discover what are the commonalities, and then how do you structure that? Yeah. That's a book. By the way, that story. So the reason I said Gina is because I know Ivelisse. She oh, was yeah. my business school classmate. Her sister Gina Rodriguez is, what? was yeah. uh, Jane the Virgin, right? Yeah, she was in that TV show. She's yeah, like a yeah, star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ivelisse, I've known Ivelisse forever. What? Um, yeah, she's amazing. And her husband, Danny, was my section mate. And his claim to fame, and I hope, Danny, I don't want you to get mad at me when I tell the story, was that... He used to watch movies during class with his laptop and he had glasses and so you could see like you were like, Oh, he's watching like, you know, Space Jam today <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> he was too smart. He didn't have to study. We definitely getting video content. He did not have to study. Um, meanwhile I was just like nervous. But um, but yeah, that that's a great story. And that you take interviews as we, we said it this morning, we were working out at seven thirty with our four year old. We say it every single day. Repeat that one more time because I just wanna like I loved it. Just say it one more time. Every day we say, today is a great day, I can and I will. Wow. And then we follow up and we say it three times, hard work pays off, hard work pays off. And it's usually my four-year-old just screaming it at us. And we added like, smart work pays off. We want to add a little Yeah, extra. smart is good because hard work being like, off, smart work pays off. like Craig, Greg McEwen said in his new book, Effortless, he compared me to this horse. What was the guy? I don't remember the name of the damn horse, but the horse worked so hard that it died <laughs> and then they like they put it in the knackers yard which apparently in, in english speak is like they like killed it for glue or whatever and i was that guy i was that the name of that horse whatever his name was like frank the horse and yeah i i was taught i think from a young age that working harder was what was the driver and i appreciate that lesson i'm glad i'm a hard worker but i learned as i got older that like burnout is real 